Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the sixth meeting of the Wellington Circle Study Working Group. Uh, my name is Michaela Niles. I'm the MassDOT project manager for this effort and I'm joined today by members of the consultant team. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and thank you to our working group members in attendance, including any elected officials on the call today. So before we launch into the presentation for today, I have I would like to open with a few procedures for today's meeting. First, please note that this virtual public meeting is being recorded. The Massachusetts Department of Transportation may choose to retain and distribute the video, still images, audio, and or chat transcript. And by continuing attendance with this virtual public meeting, you are consenting to participate in a recorded event. All recordings and chat transcripts will be considered a public record. If you are not comfortable being recorded, please turn off your camera, keep your microphone muted, and refrain from chatting in the chat or Q&A boxes. Working group members will have the opportunity to ask questions or share comments during the discussion portion of the agenda. To participate, you may use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, or if you are participating by phone, you may dial star nine. I will then call your name and you can unmute so you may share your comment or question. We ask that you please keep your microphone muted unless speaking and ask that all speakers start by stating their name. And this will benefit everyone, especially those who are participating by phone today. Working group members will also be able to share their video. You may keep your video on or off, but the main request is to minimize distractions for those who are viewing the presentation. Members of the public in attendance may submit comments or questions at any time in writing using the Q&A and meeting staff will address them as time allows towards the end of the presentation. And if you need any technical assistance, please contact Zoom technical support at 888-799-9666 or email Sarah from the study team at sstoja at hntb.com. So now moving to today's agenda, we'll have a brief overview of the study process, and then we'll present the draft study findings and recommendations, as well as the draft implementation plan. Then we'll have a discussion, and finally, we'll outline the next steps for the study. So as an overview of the study process and a little bit of background on this effort, this is a conceptual planning study to evaluate the existing and future multimodal conditions at Wellington Circle. This process includes examining ways to uh, redesign the circle to provide better connectivity and improve mobility within the city of Medford and the surrounding region. And based on the analysis and the feedback received over the course of the study, short, medium, and long-term recommendations have been developed and will be included in a draft final report that will be released for public comment and then finalized in a final report. And this next slide details the goals and objectives of the study, which were developed at the onset of the process. And these are carried throughout the study and have really helped to guide the alternatives development and analysis. And the primary goals for this effort are to improve safety and mobility for all transportation modes and users in the Wellington Circle area, improve quality of life for residents, and improve local and regional connectivity. And so next, moving to the uh, process itself, this chart uh, outlines the study's tasks with each step building upon the previous one. And the step highlighted in orange indicates where we are today. And as I mentioned today, we will be discussing the draft study findings and recommendations. And so with that, I will now hand it over to Gary McNaughton of the consultant team to walk through the draft study findings. Gary? Thank you. Uh, and really quickly, I'll start with a review of the alternatives that we looked at. Uh, if you recall, early in the study, we looked at a wide range of, of ideas and concepts and whittled those down into a series of alternatives that we took into the more detailed analysis. Uh, we talked about some of that analysis in the last meeting, but just as a quick refresher, I'll run through those alternatives that were carried into that detailed analysis. Uh, starting off with the short-term alternatives, where we had uh, really working within the existing infrastructure to the largest extent possible, something that could be implemented a little bit uh, quicker, less uh, costly, if it showed the positive improvements and benefits that justified doing something on an interim basis. So this one, uh, you'll notice, eliminates the eastbound left turn, eliminates the right turn pockets, modifies the connection down from middle Ave, uh, and this was the at-grade alternative A. It does provide some 
improvements for bicycles and pedestrians, shortening some of the crossings. But you know, the bicycle improvements are really limited to that eastbound um, connection that we're able to provide and doesn't do much for bicyclists getting around the rest of the, the circle area. Uh, for pedestrians, it does eliminate or some of the crossings, reduces the widths, but again, doesn't change the overall characteristics of the area significantly. Uh, and that one came in at a cost of about 6.2 million. And all of the costs that we had were just in today's dollars. We didn't uh, try to escalate those out given the way that inflation has been going. Uh, we tried to keep things on a nice level playing field looking at today's dollars for this comparison. Next slide is, and this will just be option B, which is we looked at um, option A where we were eliminating those right turn movements started to show some real operational problems and delays that not just were for vehicles, but started to affect pedestrian connectivity by the amount of time that we were able to provide for crossing. So we, we had an option B that kept in that eastbound right turn and then the westbound right turn pocket uh, just to give us that flexibility for signal operations. Um, doesn't <clears throat> achieve a lot of the goals that we had set out for pedestrians and bicyclists but did work out as a compromise that, that could offer some benefits uh, on that short-term short, uh, short basis. And again, similar cost at about 6.2 million for this one. You go to the next one, we start to look at the longer-term at-grade alternatives. And we had the what we were dubbing the square concept, and, and that was really just named based on the area to the north of Revere Beach Parkway. Uh, where we have the square that was created by the block between Middlesex Ave and Fellsway. Uh, this one features the quadrant roadway connections so that you have the connection from Fellsway to the south, the Revere Beach Parkway to the east, which we had talked about being you know, really the, one of the heaviest moves in that south to east connection in both directions being a, a heavy movement at all times of the day. And that this alternative, and you'll see the other at grade alternatives include that quadrant roadway that provides that connection more directly. The difference is how we're treating the connections to the north and are we making straight through connections to Middlesex uh, and, and where does Fellsway connect in uh, on the other alternatives. This at grade uh, square concept had a cost of about $36.7 million. If you go to the next slide, we have the triangle version. Again, uh, similar, but you'll notice that this one takes Fellsway and connects it primarily to Revere Beach Parkway to the east. Uh, and that's really the major difference that results in you know, a triangular shaped uh, area to the north of the parkway. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, you'll notice to the south, it's very similar with the similar connector road, uh, really is just how we're structuring it to the north. Uh, one of the features that I do wanna call out on these is the enhancements that are done for pedestrians and bicyclists. So everything you see in that, Blue aqua color is a bicycle facility. Everything in that tan uh, color are new pedestrian facilities. So you'll notice we, you know, throughout this concept, and there was the same thing on the square concept that we have bicycle and pedestrian amenities uh, throughout the air throughout the entire study area. Uh, the one area that both of the accurate alternatives don't provide that pedestrian connection is on the east side of the circle uh, area, right? there where the cursor is, um, where we don't have the ability to implement an at-grade crossing, just the way that the, the operations work there. We constantly have traffic flowing in that area, so there's no good way to include an at-grade pedestrian crossing in that area. Uh, the cost of the triangle alternative is, is at a similar $36.7 million. You go to the next slide, and this was a variation of the triangle concept, and this built off of the bus network that was in place as we were working through the study, there's been some modifications to that that we'll touch on. But this really was looking to see what can we do to improve the transit service to and from uh, that, that comes into Wellington Station through the Wellington Circle area. And that transit service today is exclusively on Fellsway. Uh, so this, this concept focuses on how can we Im implement uh, transit lanes that connect up to the Fellsway provide some better uh, service and better opportunities to provide transit through this area. Uh, and you'll notice that we do add a lane on that connection uh, alongside the triangle where the arrow is pointing. That is a new uh, transit lane that would be provided. So we have a slightly wider cross section through that area. Similarly, coming down Fellsway, 
we do create a, a little bit of an ex, extra pavement width as you come down into the signal to accommodate that transit service. We're maintaining the stops where they are today, up uh, to the northwest, I guess, of the triangle, so keeping those in that same location. Uh, this one does have a slightly higher cost just due to the additional pavement uh, that's allocated for the transit service coming in at about $38.3 million. Next slide. So as I noted, uh, the at-grade alternatives didn't have the opportunity to put in an at-grade pedestrian crossing on the east side uh, of the Fellsway Middlesex Ave uh, connection. And through the process, we had looked at a, an elevated pedestrian crossing and we had developed a concept plan that shows that elevated crossing. We know there's a lot more work to do uh, to investigate and really come up with a, a solid design that can work for this. But this really is an independent <clears throat> assessment of from the, the accurate alternatives. So this can really be added on to either of the accurate alternatives, whatever it was that, that came out of the study. So we really didn't try to develop this in great detail, knowing that there's a lot more design and even aesthetics uh, that need to go into this and connectivity. So this is an independent piece that can be added on to the accurate alternative and would be carried forward as the project advances into design development. Uh, the bridge, the pedestrian bridge alone as laid out here has a cost a little bit under $36 million. If you go to the next slide, we did also include the grade separated alternative that you'll recall that took the <clears throat> Route 16, Revere Beach Parkway, Mystic Valley Parkway up over the circle area. Uh, the challenges, you know, that, that's the connection that was most readily achievable with the structure provided the most benefit, uh, while it would have been nice to have connected the, you know, south to the east due to some of the challenges, it, it really didn't serve well to grade separate that, carrying that connection on structures. Really, this east-west connection made the most sense. But you'll notice it does simplify the accurate roadway uh, network in terms of reducing the width, but it, it has to end up being fairly chopped up due to the connections and the, the needs for piers and columns to support the elevated structure. Uh, so you do see some of the same structure with that quadrant roadway trying to make that connection to from the south to the east, uh, even under the accurate, the great separated alternative. So you still have a fairly complex roadway network underneath uh, and it doesn't quite give you the real simple version that you would have liked to achieve by grade separating. <clears throat> the overall cost of the grade separated structure ends up close to 177 million. So considerably more than what we're seeing with any of the at grade alternatives. Um, so that was a quick review of what we've looked at before and I'll turn it over to Natalie to start talk about, talking about the evaluation and recommendations that we provided. Thanks Gary. Um, so this slide summarizes the evaluation criteria framework that we used uh, to evaluate the alternatives um, to see how well each met the different study goals. Um, so we reviewed this at the last meeting. And I'm just going to do a uh, quick recap um, that we had a set of evaluation criteria that were evaluated to see um, if there were benefits or neutral outcomes or impacts to the study area under each alternative for each of these categories. Um, and so this is meant to provide a summary and comparison across alternatives, but was backed by more detailed analysis uh, under each of these topics. And so looking at the summarized results across alternatives um, and for each of the evaluation criteria, you can see that the long-term at-grade transit enhanced alternative rose to the top uh, as the recommended alternative. And that's because of um, the overall benefits that it provides across the evaluation criteria. Um, you'll see it has a benefit in each category except for vehicle operations. Um, and that's because there is a trade-off between the improvements made for pedestrians, bicycles, and transit users um, with vehicle operations that we uh, discussed in detail previously. Um, but overall, it does have the most positive outcomes. Going into further detail on that, um, can see here that the um, transit enhanced alternative has the same benefits as all of the other long-term at-grade alternatives with the addition of um, other transit operations and access benefits. 
And so this was the only alternative to have measurable improvements for transit operations. This is a summary of the recommended alternative. Um, you can see here, this is the same graphic we saw a few slides ago. Uh, the main differentiator with this alternative is the dedicated bus lanes that are on Revere Beach Parkway to the east of the circle and the Fellsway to the north of the circle. Uh, so this provides bus priority for MBTA bus routes 100, 108, and 134. Uh, in addition to these bus lanes, the alternative also includes dedicated bus phase signals and floating bus stops uh, for the bus stops in this area uh, that are shown on the Fellsway. Um, so those provide additional space for waiting pedestrians and then also reduce conflicts between the bus stop and the separated bike lane that is part of this alternative. Uh, so because this is still in a concept phase in terms of design, uh, there would be next steps as part of the project development process as this transitions into a project. And so um, likely next steps for this concept to advance would be completing a full survey in the study area, evaluating the feasibility of a crossing or the pedestrian bridge that um, Gary was talking about over Revere Beach Parkway uh, to provide a more direct connection to Wellington Station um, to the east of that intersection with Revere Beach Parkway. And then also looking at the feasibility of integrating bus lanes on Mystic Valley Parkway. And so those would benefit uh, the Route 134 um, more because the 134 is running east-west on Mystic Valley Parkway and then Revere Beach Parkway uh, as it goes into Wellington Station. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Gary to talk more about some of the specific uh, transit improvements as part of the alternative. Thanks, Natalie. And as, as was referenced, you know, the, the transit enhanced alternative is really the one that does provide some significant benefits to transit service. Uh, as we were working through this project, you know, we were working off of the bus network that existed at, at that time that still exists, uh, independent of the bus network redesign that I'll talk about in a minute. So we were really focused on, you know, where is the service coming today? Where can we provide some benefits that led us to the, the alternative that you saw with the connections up to and from the Fells Way? And with the addition of those transit connections and the, and the dedicated lanes, we are getting significant tra travel time savings for transit and then quality of service improvements. And those are really the two primary metrics that we were looking at uh, for transit. Uh, if you go to the next slide, we start to look at the bus network redesign. And you know the MBTA went through an extensive process to re-envision re their bus network. Uh, and with that, they still continue to have a service on the Fells Way, but there's also uh, likely to be service continuing to the west on Mystic Valley Parkway. So we, you know, just timing wise where the two efforts were, were going along concurrently, you know, our design does not include um, the, the accommodation of bus lanes to and from uh, Mystic Valley Parkway, but that's something that can be evaluated as the project advances into detailed design. Uh, some of the other features of the bus network redesign is increased frequency, uh, and they're looking at starting some of this over the summer in phases. So you know, as this project moves forward, they'll be able to fully integrate the any changes that happen with that bus network uh, and make sure that we're able to continue to provide service uh, and improvements for service through the circle. Next slide. And then this really just illustrates those routes on our preferred alternatives so that you're seeing the connections to and from the Fells Way uh, with a much more direct route. You know, if you think about the square alternative and, and the route that that would have been required for folks to and from the Fells Way, you can kind of see how the triangle one makes a lot more sense for transit service. Uh, and then, you know, we'll certainly be able to integrate service to and from the West uh, as a straight through movement. So we feel that this alternative overall does a nice job of, of accommodating those transit routes that are expected to be there for the future. Uh, we, and we will also be implementing, you know, the other transit service improvements, um, you know, including optimization for signals and bus priority, et cetera. Again, all those will be incorporated as the design works into the, the further details of design development. Go to the next slide. So when we start to look at, we talk about improvements, um, what we're looking at is roughly a 25% time saving uh, for bus travel through the project area. And again, that's simply looking at 
the existing routes that travel through the area. So, you know, a fairly measurable and appreciable improvement in overall transit uh, travel times that we're able to achieve. If you go to the next slide, uh, and what you see is, you know, just another way to illustrate the travel time savings. And when you compare, you know, the at grade, which was the square alternative uh, versus, and then the long term with it, you saw both of those were actually increasing transit travel time compared to the uh, at grade transit and enhanced alternative, which provides significant savings in travel time. Next slide. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back to Michaela. Thank you, Gary. Yes, in addition to the draft findings and recommendations, the draft report will also include a draft implementation plan that identifies potential funding sources and outlines next steps for the project following the completion of this conceptual planning study. So the chart on this next slide outlines the initial stages of the project development process. And the process begins with the identification of the project need. From there, a planning effort may be initiated to evaluate the issues and opportunities and develop recommendations. And this conceptual planning study fulfills this step. And elements of this study can be wrapped into the, uh, the following project development steps. So project initiation then can follow the completion of the planning process where the project is further defined, evaluated, and once approved, a project manager is assigned and the design process may begin. And so this next slide uh, further outlines the steps of the design process. And so the mile steps for design include 25% design, which involves local agency coordination, survey, preliminary design, and right of way. 75% design involves uh, the development of more detailed plans, uh, coordination in any NEPA or NEPA filings and obtaining any permits that might be needed. And 100% design involves finalizing those plans and cost estimates. And public outreach occurs throughout this process. And this next slide outlines the remaining steps of the project development process. The project fo following design, the project may then be programmed where funding sources will be identified and the procurement process can then begin. And then once complete, the project may be constructed. And this next slide details some of those funding sources that might be available for this project. The Encore Section 61 finding includes language about funding for the concept design. The project could also be included in the Transportation Improvement Program, which was managed by the Boston MPO. And there are also federal discretionary grant opportunities that could be explored as well, including the Carbon Reduction Program and the Safe Streets and Roads for All Program. And so with that, at this point, I would like to move to the working group discussion portion of today's meeting. Um, on this next slide, uh, this shows the uh, recommendation uh, or the recommended alternative rather. So for members of the working group, please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen to share any comments or questions that you may have. I see a couple in the chat already, one from Bill Carlson, who uh, mentions that uh, the study has produced a better result uh, than expected and agrees with the chosen alternative and the recommended next steps. So thank you, Bill. And Councillor Linehan mentions that this is a promising design, uh, especially the benefits uh, for bus riders. So thank you for your comments. Uh, I next see a uh, question from Amy who asks, uh, has there been any discussion or attempts to quantify mode shift that may occur due to bus improvements? and thus reducing volumes. Gary? Yes, so there was modeling of the future year uh, conditions, and I think that the future year showed increased travel in all modes. So it, it's hard to quantify straight from that, you know, what is mode shift versus new trips, because there is a lot of growth that's projected out in this area and the surrounding region. Uh, so it, it, it's not a question that we have a definitive answer to, I think. You know, I'm, I'm a believer of, you know, if you build it, they will come as well. So, you know, some of the goals of this project were not to improve vehicle operations. You know, while great if we can, you know, provide some enhancements and improved efficiency, you know, that wasn't one of the primary goals of this project. And I think we recognize, you know, we can't design our way out of traffic congestion. Uh, we need to provide other modes for folks to do it. And that's what this is really trying to do. And where it doesn't increase capacity for vehicles, I think, you know, by that fact alone, you'll start to see that mode shift 
uh, whether it's to transit or walking or biking, uh, as additional development occurs in the area, you know, you will see some of that come to realization just by the facts of, you know, the, the roadway capacity that is there uh, and will be there in the future. Are there any other comments or questions from the working group? Alicia, I see your raised hand. Hi, thank you very much. Alicia Hunt, Director of Planning, Development and Sustainability for the City of Medford. We really appreciate all the work that has gone into this project and everything that everybody has been doing on this and to come up with different options um, for us to, to step through all of this. It's been very helpful and enlightening to watch the entire process um, because this is a very difficult intersection. Um, everybody knows it. And I, we've been talking to uh, potential developers. I think that people are aware that there's a, a housing project going down just just off the screen here, Mystic Valley Parkway, it's a 40B, so it will be approved by this. We don't have a choice, it, it will be approved. Um, and some of the discussion that, that comes up during this is that this location is, we heard from our transportation consultant and at peer review on that on Monday. And he commented on the fact that it is quite close to the Wellington T station, but that it, it appears to be on the order of a 14 step process to cross from where that development would be to actually get to the T. I don't know if his if he was including every driveway in the whole length, but it's not easy. It's not safe. I, I myself have visited establishments there. And when I commented on walking through, they, they all look at me like I'm insane that I attempted to cross Wellington Circle on foot. Um, and we really would like people to be able to live on one side of this quadrant and cross to another and to be able to get through this with bicycles. Um, so anything that improves the pedestrian experience, that makes it more bike friendly. Um, I mean, people, the idea of biking through here is like just blows people's minds right now that anybody would ever try that. Um, so helping that this would make things, I feel that it would be really helpful for us to see what, what do cross sections look like because that helps make it real, particularly for people who don't typically bicycle. I will tell you that I am not an expert bicyclist, so I would really love to hear from my bicycle community what they think about these improvements and whether there's enough information here for them to know whether they would feel safer going through Wellington Circle with these improvements. Um, and Basically, I, I appreciate all the effort that goes into this. I wish there was a magic bullet for this intersection. I feel like what I have learned from this process is there is no magic bullet for this intersection um, and that we are going to have to find the best that we can with the situation that we have. Um, so I appreciate all of this and I look forward to hearing from other people. Thank you. I next see a raised hand from Peter. Hi, yes, thank you. Peter Calvis, Walk Medford. And I would like to say, I appreciate the, the process that has gone through with this intersection and the improvements to the bicycle and pedestrian experience uh, through this intersection as a resident of 30 Revere Beach Parkway who walks and bikes through this intersection on a fairly regular basis. I can tell you it is a harrowing experience right now. And while I must admit, looking at this, there, are still too many vehicle lanes for my liking. I understand the process and the limitations on this intersection. So I appreciate the being able to do what this process has been able to do under these circumstances. So I still would like there to be fewer vehicle lanes and I understand why there can't be. Thank you. I next see a raised hand from Jonah. Hi, thank you. Um, Jonah Kirenza, the executive director of uh, Bike to the Sea. And um, uh, my thoughts on this topic are um, around uh, operational strategies. I think um, the, the geometry here seems a lot better. And I agree with what everybody else has said. Um, I think the provision of continuous bike facilities that are separated um, is obviously a, a good solution to get people out of their cars and make it easier to connect from transit um, to destinations and from home to transit. Um, and of course, pedestrian infrastructure everywhere is, it should be a, a, you know, a no brainer. And it looks like you've done a good job with that. So I'm curious about um, two things. One, further geometrical changes to protect intersections and avoid 
um, particularly turning conflict crashes. Um, with the volume of turn lanes, you know, I, I know we need to move the vehicles through and, and certainly the bus. So what opportunities are there to, within uh, the constraints of, of large vehicle turning requirements, um, provide some additional um, space for um, accommodating uh, increased sort of hardening of protections at intersections for pedestrians and bicyclists, um, thinking particularly about like the mass stop protected bikeway design guide and opportunities to insert that. Um, then also um, a complement to that is the, um, the use of operational strategies. So thinking about um, phase separation, of course, but also leading pedestrian intervals, um, leading bike intervals if and where there will be bike signals. Um, so we'd we'll love to hear some feedback on on those ideas as the design develops. Yeah, and, and as it develops, that's when those start to get looked at of the specific intersection design. There are absolutely some opportunities to implement some of those features that you talked about. You know, we've done a lot to restrict turns and, and keep movements from happening except where they need to. Uh, so, you know, particularly if you look at the westerly intersection, you know, there's no left turn coming westbound. There's no right turns coming westbound and northbound. So those give you a lot of opportunity to create good protected areas, good protected crossings. Uh, you know, and where we can't have fully protected crossings. And I think we're mostly doing uh, fully protected. There might be a couple where we do concurrent, you know, LPIs are certainly going to be part of that design, but th those are all the elements that get built in as the project advances into that design. You know, we're, we're working off aerial imagery and GIS mapping, um, you know, so the, the amount of detail that we tend to show until you've gotten to the point of having a real ground survey, um, it just ends up, you know, not not adding value at this point, but certainly as the designs develop, those are all things that are going to be included in the report to make sure that they're considered and incorporated um, whenever feasible. That's great. Yeah, thanks for that feedback. And I, I like the directness that this the overall geometry shows at this scale of the routes. I think that's really important for pedestrians and bicyclists to have that sort of like line of sight connectivity um, to their destination and be able to follow it. So nice. Thank you. And I see a comment from Peter who seconds the need for physical protection where possible. So thank you, Peter. I also see a question uh, from Amanda Bells who says, uh, the distance when crossing the street at some of the intersections look far from corner to corner and asks, what is the distance from uh, for the crosswalks and can the cross signal be extended if necessary? Yeah, so the, they do vary. We've tried to introduce, you know, medians where we can to just give pedestrians a little bit of a break uh, and make it feel a little less daunting, even, you know, that we, we are trying to phase it so that they can make those movements in a single crossing. Uh, the, you know, crossings and, uh, you know, we do have some cross sections that are going to end up being in the report uh, that do show the stark difference from this versus existing. And you really do see how much of a reduction there is in the overall pavement. Uh, depending on where you're looking at, you know, the crossings are two lanes before you hit a median, in some cases three. I think the longest one that we have is kind of that southwest corner of the triangle where, you know, we have a narrower median uh, shown. And, and again, that becomes a design detail of does that get a little wider, the triangle. Open area gets a little smaller to provide some refuge area. Uh, but that crossing, as it's shown there, is six lanes. Uh, that's the only one I believe that is that long. Uh, all of the others are either broken up on uh, in fewer lanes or with medians. I also see Councillor Linderhand supporting the uh, protection point as well. So thank you. I next see a raised hand from Brad. Hi, Michaela. Thanks so much. Nice work team. And as always, Somerville's posture in this working group is to support our neighbors to the north. So I'm so glad to see great enthusiastic participation from the city of Medford, from residents, from activists, from staff, as well as the city of Malden. One thing that I would call everybody's attention to is remind us that we're at the planning study stage. And although we've done important due diligence together to date, and we seem to be landing on a preferred alternative that meets many of our regional and local values, this is still just the start of the design development process. Going through similar projects like this, kind of from uh, cradle to grave, to use one term, my experience is that things only get more progressive, only get more human-centered, only get more economically vital and vibrant as the designs develop. Just last night, our partners at MassDOT hosted a community meeting 
for a 25% design milestone on a, a similarly complex series of state controlled intersections just across the river in Somerville. And based on responsive design development and quantitative analysis by MassDOT, we've seen that lane drops are on the table, dedicated transit facilities are on the table, shared use paths um, and better walking and biking geometries and crossing distances actually are being refined from stage to stage, planning study, preliminary design, advanced design. So I want everybody to understand that these are helpful diagrammatic schemes, but we have a lot of work to do together over the coming years to turn this into reality. And just because an answer has been no on a lane drop or another transit facility in this stage of the process, doesn't mean you all, we all should not continue asking those questions going forward. Um, Michaela, I'll have some feedback and thoughts on the implementation slides that you all brought up later. Why don't I hold those for the moment, but I'm, I'm really glad that's part of today's agenda. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions from members of the working group at this time? Please use your raised hand button at the bottom of your screen. It looks like Jonah has his up. It's just blending in with the background. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Jonah? Sorry, legacy hand. All right, I'm not seeing any additional raised hands from the working group at this time. So I think at this point, we can move to open it up to members of the public in attendance. If you'd like to submit a comment or question in writing, please use the Q&A. Or if you'd like to share a comment or question verbally, please use uh, the raise hand button or dial star nine if you're participating by phone. And this certainly isn't the only opportunity to comment. You may also share comments or questions at any time throughout the study process using the comment form on our study website. So I see a raised hand from Emily. You should have a notification on your screen to unmute. Hi, thank you. I'm Emily O'Brien of Medford Bicycle Advisory Commission. And first of all, we're really, uh, really appreciate all the work that's being done on this. This is obviously a really important priority for us. Um, I think mostly the comments that I have at the moment are not things that can be answered at this stage of the design. Um, I do see, as has been already mentioned, there are a lot of potential turning conflicts um, there are a lot of places where it looks like there's some sort of a bike lane or bike facility that crosses driveways, that crosses intersections, um, and it will ultimately come down to the final details of the design, how good or bad that really is. Um, sometimes there's a lot of provision for bicyclists trying to make going straight when there's other traffic going right but it's still really, really hard to turn left. Um, lots of bicyclists will go all kinds of weird ways to avoid making left turns. Um, and, that's, and that's often just, it's a, it's a difficult thing to plan for. Um, sometimes it may be even just a question of adding additional really big, bright, bold charros to left turn lanes and dotted bike lanes in advance of it to help people cross a couple of lanes of traffic um, in order to make it to a left turn lane so they can turn left. That also requires a certain amount of traffic calming. Um, if people, if traffic is flowing at 35 or 40 miles an hour leading up to that point, it's very difficult to cross three lanes to make a left turn. Um, so the overall speeds when the lights are green are definitely gonna be a major factor there, um, and also provisions for people to make, you know, the multi-stage left so that every user doesn't have to make the vehicular type of left. Um, you know, if it ends up being that if you want to turn left and you don't want to try to cross three lanes of traffic, now it'll take you four cycles to make that left turn. That's not really a very satisfactory experience. Um, and I know that a lot of those details are quite further down the line from where we are right now. Um, but I hope we can keep those in mind um, as this process proceeds. Um, and I'm also wondering about how much 
uh, advanced anticipation there might be of possible changes to the bus network that aren't part of that don't exist now and are not part of the current bus network redesign plan. Um, anything, any you know, thirty or sixty million dollar project that gets done to this intersection, we hope will last for some time, and the transit needs will change, and hopefully the bus network will only increase. So I think it's also important to keep in mind that there will, we certainly hope, there will be bus routes going through this area that don't exist right now and are also not being planned right now and that has nobody nobody has really thought of right now, um, but that in 10 or 20 years um, will become more necessary um, or more economical, et cetera. So um, I'm interested in how, the, how that uh, planning is considered, um, but also thanks very much for all the work that you're doing. It certainly looks like a big intersect, a big improvement all around. Yes, as far as the transit, you know, I feel that with the bus network redesign, if we include the accommodations to get to the west uh, along Mystic Valley Parkway, we, we've covered most of this intersection or this area. You know, the one missing connection we would have would be to the south along Fellsway. Um, and, you know, as, as Brad knows from other projects, as these get into design development, we, we tend to look at, you know, what is possible? What can you include um, and work, you know, in collaboration with the MBTA on, on what they're looking at for service? What would they look at for service? If you can provide a high quality facility for them, would they use it? You know, and then they, they can look at their overall network uh, of various transit systems, whether it's, you know, buses or the orange line in this area and see, is that a benefit? Is there some value in incorporating elements of that? into a design as it develops. And, you know, the design is, is not, you know, an overnight process. So there is certainly some time to make sure that those conversations happen and you are considerate of what you are building so that it does have that longer, um, you know, useful life to it. And you're not regretting what you've built five years or 10 years down the road. So that's certainly part of the design development process. Thank you. I next see a question in the Q&A from Joshua, who asks, uh, for the transit enhanced alternative, it seems that removing the one-way northbound uh, stub for Middlesex Ave would reduce conflicts, all things considered. Is it retained for large vehicle access? Yeah, I don't know if, um, Natalie, if you can go back to that alternative, uh, the graphic that just shows the preferred alternative. Um, there you go. So it's that stub, that one-way connection that runs uh, up along the right side of, I guess, the smaller triangle to the north. Uh, we maintain that in this design stage to make sure that we have flexibility for abutting land uses. Uh, it does provide a, a more direct connection and, and facilitates access up to Middlesex Ave and, and 9th Street. Um, you know, as, as properties redevelop as plans come along, you know, that's an area that would certainly be revisited during the design development. Um, but for the purposes in the stage of the design we're at, we felt it better to, to keep it there uh, and, and provide for that accommodation, knowing that, you know, that and really all of the access, you'll notice throughout the project area, we maintained access wherever it exists today, you know, and, and certainly as projects redevelop, that would be, you know, revisited and, and hopefully you can look at improvements to some of those access points. Thank you. And thank you for the question. I next see uh, some comments in the Q&A from Jessica, who uh, says, I can't say this enough. The walkability of this intersection should be prioritized. It has historically been an unsafe area to cross, particularly on Revere Beach Parkway to Wellings Circle, and it shares another comment that says uh, the focus on bike and pedestrian amenities and bike lanes are wonderful, uh, but without bus lane enforcement, we should consider how these are working and also looks forward to watching this project progress. So thank you, Jessica, for sharing those comments. We appreciate you sharing them, and we appreciate everyone for being here today and sharing your comments and questions and feedback with us. I next see a raised hand from Frederick. You should have a notification on your screen to unmute. Hey, Jonah. 
Yeah. Are you really in the snow outside? <laughs> Uh, at the moment. Gary, can I get the snap? Gary, can All right. Thank you for uh, sharing those comments. We appreciate you, uh, your participation here today. Uh, I next see a question in the Q&A from Joan who asks, is there an opportunity to extend the project scope to include the bridge over the Mystic River and connect up to the 3828 project area? So sorry. Um... We haven't looked at that. I think as as planning and, and design development advances, you'd have to look at you know where where does this go? We sh we just went with our project limits and we show you know bike lanes, pedestrian accommodations that connect there. You know as it advances, you end up with a gap, and we find this on all sorts of projects where you know where where does one begin, the next one pick up. So I think you'd, you'd start to step back and look at you know, what could you design along that stretch. There's certainly some opportunities there, but you know, as part of this study, we were trying to keep our scope um, within this immediate area so that we're designing for this and, and not extending it out. But that's something that certainly as the project advances should be evaluated. Thank you. And thank you for the question, Joan. I next see a comment in the Q&A from Tom who asks about the, um, the triangle uh, green space and uh, mentions that uh, they would prefer an alternative that improves transit, walking, and biking, and also creates usable green space at one of the corners, uh, and mentions uh, that kind of relates to the, the middle green space in, in this alternative. Yeah, and I think as you get into, you know, again, real ground survey, and you start to lay out the roadways, uh, you know, you look for opportunities of where can we add that open space. There's some inherent nature of the roadway network that's laid out as part of this alternative that leaves some open space there, but you can certainly shift the alignments to maximize the open space on the outside. Um, you know, you're always going to have something in the middle there. Uh, and it, it that's really, when, as you really start to get down into it, you know, you look at where do we want that space? Can we shift things even if it's 10 or 15 feet and provide additional open space on the outside? Um, you know, those are certainly things that as the de design evolves and you have real, you know, hard right of way lines and um, the like that you can really get into that detail. Uh, some of those middle spaces, you know, I think this is another comment about stormwater. You know, there's certainly stormwater and environmental uh, areas that in, in uses for that space. Uh, but, you know, to the, the earlier comment, you may find, well, if we if we can shift the roadway in, maybe we connect some open space that's adjacent to the abutting land uses that's better served. So those are all just balancing uh, those, those various needs and, and desires that you'd have as the design develops. Thank you. And thank you for sharing the comment or that question rather. And again, thank you all for being here today to share your comments and questions with us. We appreciate it. I don't see any additional uh, comments or questions in the Q and A at this time or any raised hands, but again, Please, if you have any comments or questions that you'd like to share verbally, please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. Or if you're uh, participating by phone, you can dial star nine to raise your virtual hand. Uh, you may also type your comment or question in the Q&A using the Q&A box. And I also see a comment from Todd from the city of Medford who said uh, to go along with uh, Brad's point, uh, we can also continue to advocate for bike ped bridges. Yes, as part of the next uh, processes, those are things that can be further looked at as well. So seeing no comments or questions popping up in the Q&A or raised hands, I, I do want to circle back to Brad about your uh, comments about the draft implementation plan before we move to next steps for the study. Well, thanks, Michaela. Why don't you frame up next steps if it's okay? Uh, so I don't um, ask silly questions that you're about to answer um, or address with your next slides. I did notice a slide earlier that talked about the typical design development process, but um, maybe you can provide a transition from the project team and, and then we can go back to my question or observation if, if that's okay. Yeah, that sounds good. So moving to the next steps portion of this presentation today, we will be working to finalize the draft recommendations that will be included in the draft final report, which will be released for a 30-day public comment period next month. 
And during this time, the third public information meeting will also be held uh, to present this draft findings and recommendations information. And the input received will then be incorporated into the final report, which is expected to be released in May. And so, as I mentioned, we're planning to have our next public meeting next month, and that will uh, coincide with the release of the draft plan for review and public comment. I see a raised hand from Michael. You should have a notification on your screen to unmute. Gary, not Gary, so we can't uh, hear you. So if you'd like to uh, type your comment or question, uh, please feel free to do so in the Q&A and we'll be able to uh, get back to you with that. Thank you. Brad, I see your hand. Kelly, would you mind going back um, in the deck earlier when you described the typical project development process? Yes, perfect. Thank you. So I think we're at a really unique moment, folks, where a long range visionary big ticket project like this has really unique opportunities to have a like a five or six year journey instead of a 15 or 16 year journey. And part of the reason is the federal infrastructure investment uh, that is flowing out of Washington to state agencies like MassDOT. Part of it is um, kind of just state level focus on MBTA capital investment plan, Mass DOT capital investment plan, DCR capital investment plan. The Healy administration is really being quick out of the gate these first two months of the new year and is starting to frame up important funding and pipeline opportunities. There is a regional body that administers approximately $100 million of annual capital funding for both um, transit and roadway projects serving the 100 cities and towns of Metro Boston. And it's in the middle of its annual capital investment process right now. Um, so I think that there's this um, uh, you know, constellation of stars here that's kind of coming into alignment. And if MassDOT and the city of Medford as kind of the primary proponents here um, are able to work with some of these project partners and funding entities, I think that you all could identify design budgets to take the important planning study work and pivot quickly into design development. So Mikhail, if you don't mind, could you go to the next slide, please, where you start to talk about those milestones? Yeah, I mean, typically, in a project like McGrath Boulevard, we reached this equivalent stage in like 2013. And here we are now in 2023, and we're at approximately a 25% design milestone. We can't let that happen with Wellington Circle. We have problems to solve. The community deserves better. The region deserves better. And so I would implore all of you to hold hands and think about ways we can identify scopes um, and propose this project for state design support to actually take these great ideas while they're fresh in everybody's heads and really transition into design development uh, and then get this project ready, uh, shovel ready for this incredible, you know, once in a generation moment of capital investment coming out of Washington and coming out of Beacon Hill. Happy to answer any more specific questions, but, but I think the time's now. Thank you, Brad. And Natalie, I think moving to the final slide of today's presentation, I will uh, just kind of wrap up today's meeting with uh, just mentioning again that the next public meeting will be held next month to present these uh, draft study findings and recommendations. And also, we will be releasing this draft final report for review and public comment. So for more information on the study or to sign up for study updates, please visit our study website. The materials from this meeting, including the video recording, will be made available on the study website. And so with that, that concludes today's meeting. Uh, thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>